all know what a phantom limb is when an arm is amputated or a leg is amputated for gangrene or you lose it in war, for example, in the Iraq war. It's now a serious problem. You continue to vividly feel the presence of that missing arm, and that's called a phantom arm or a phantom leg. In fact, you can get a phantom with almost any part of the body. Believe it or not, even with internal viscera. I've had patients with the uterus removed, hysterectomy, who have a phantom uterus, including phantom menstrual cramps at the appropriate time of the month. And in fact, one student asked me the other day, do they get phantom PMS? <laughs> Subject ripe for scientific inquiry, but we haven't pursued that. Okay, now the next question is, what can you learn about phantom limbs by doing experiments? One of the things we found was about half the patients with phantom limbs claim that they can move the phantom. It'll pat his brother on the shoulder, it'll answer the phone when it rings, it'll wave goodbye. These are very compelling, vivid sensations. Patient's not delusional, he knows that the arm is not there, but nevertheless it's a compelling sensory experience for the patient. But however, about half the patients, this doesn't happen. The phantom limb, they'll say, doctor, the phantom limb is paralyzed. It's fixed in a clenched spasm and is excruciatingly painful. If only I could move it, maybe the pain will be relieved. Now, why would a phantom limb be paralyzed? It sounds like an oxymoron. When we looked at the case sheets, what we found was, these people with the paralyzed phantom limbs, the original arm was paralyzed because of a peripheral nerve injury. The actual nerve supplying the arm was severed, was cut by, say, a motorcycle accident. So the patient had an actual arm, which is painful, in a sling for a few months or a year, and then in a misguided attempt to get rid of the pain in the arm, the surgeon amputates the arm, and then you get a phantom arm with the same pains, right? And this is a serious clinical problem. Patients become depressed. Some of them are driven to suicide. Okay? So how do you treat this syndrome? Now, why do you get a paralyzed phantom limb? When I looked at the case sheet, I found that they had an actual arm, and the nerve supplying the arm had been cut, and the actual arm had been paralyzed and lying in a sling for several months before the amputation, and this pain then gets carried over into the phantom it itself. Why does this happen? When the arm was intact but paralyzed, the brain sends commands to the arm, the front of the brain, saying, move. But it's getting visual feedback saying, no. Move, no, move, no, move, no. And this gets wired into the circuitry of the brain, and we call this learned paralysis. Okay, the brain learns because of this Hebbian associative link that the mere command to move the arm creates a sensation of a paralyzed arm. And then when you amputate the arm, this learned paralysis carries over into, the, into your body image and into your phantom, okay? Now, how do you help these patients? How do you unlearn the learned paralysis so you can relieve him of this excruciating, clenching spasm of the phantom arm? Well, we said, what if you now send the command to the phantom, but give him visual feedback that it's obeying his command, right? Maybe you can relieve the phantom pain, the phantom cramp. How do you do that? Well, virtual reality, but that costs millions of dollars. So I hit on a way of doing this for three dollars, but don't tell my funding agencies. <laughs> okay. What you do is you create what I call a mirror box. You have a cardboard box with a mirror in the middle, and then you put the phantom. So my first patient, Derek, came in. He had his arm amputated 10 years ago. He had a brachial avulsion, so the nerves were cut, and the arm was paralyzed, lying in a sling for a year, and then the arm was amputated. He had a phantom arm, excruciatingly painful, and he couldn't move it. It was a paralyzed phantom arm. So he came there, and I gave him a mirror like that in a box, okay, which I call a mirror box, right? And the patient puts his phantom left arm, which is clenched and in spasm on the left side of the mirror, and the normal hand on the right side of the mirror, and makes the same posture, the clenched posture, and looks inside the mirror. And what does he experience? He, he looks at the phantom being resurrected because he's looking at the reflection of the normal arm in the mirror, and it looks like this phantom has been resurrected. Now I said, now look, wiggle your phantom, your real fingers, or move your real fingers, while looking in the mirror, he's gonna get the visual impression that the phantom is moving, right? That's obvious. But the astonishing thing is, the patient then says, oh my God, my phantom is moving again, and the pain, the clenching spasm is relieved. I remember my first patient who came in, My, my, my first patient came in and he looked in the mirror and I said, 
look at your reflection of your phantom. He's, and he started giggling, he says, I can see my phantom. But he's not stupid, he knows it's not real, he knows it's a mirror reflection, but it's a vivid sensory experience. Now I said, move your normal hand and phantom. He said, oh, I can't move my phantom, you know that, it's painful. I said, move your normal hand. And he says, oh my God, my phantom is moving again. I don't believe this, and my pain is being relieved, okay? And then I said, close your eyes. He closed his eyes and move your normal hand. Oh, nothing, it, it's clenched again. Okay, open your eyes. Oh my God, oh my God, it's moving again. So he's like a kid in a candy store. So I said, okay, this proves my theory about learned paralysis and the critical role of visual input. But I'm not going to get a Nobel Prize for getting somebody to move his phantom limb. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a completely useless ability, if you think about it. But, but then I started realizing maybe other kinds of paralysis that you see in, 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 in neurology, like stroke, focal dystonias. There may be a learned component to this, which you can overcome with the simple device of using a mirror. So I said, look, Derek, well, first of all, the guy can't just go around carrying a mirror to alleviate his pain. I said, look, Derek, take it home and practice with it for a week or two. Maybe after repeated practice, you can dispense with the mirror, unlearn the paralysis, and start moving your paralyzed arm, and then relieve yourself of pain. So he said, okay, and he took it home. I said, look, it's after all $2, take it home. So he t took it home, and after two weeks, he phones me, and he said, doctor, you're not going to believe this. I said, what? He said, it's gone. I said, what's gone? I thought maybe the mirror box was gone. <laughs> he said, no, 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 you know, this phantom I've had for the last 10 years, it's disappeared. And I said, I got worried. I said, my God, this, I mean, I've changed this guy's body image. What about human subjects, ethics, and all of that? And I said, Derek, does this bother you? He said, no. Last three days, I've not had a phantom arm, and therefore, no phantom elbow pain, no clenching, no phantom forearm pain. All those pains have gone away. But the problem is, I still have my phantom fingers dangling from the shoulder, and your box doesn't reach. So, can you change the design and put it on my forehead so I can, you know, do this and eliminate my phantom fingers? I, he thought I was some kind of magician. Why does this happen? It's because the brain is faced with tremendous sensory conflict. It's getting messages from vision saying the phantom is back. On the other hand, there's no proprioception. Muscle signals saying that there is no arm, right? And your motor command saying there is an arm. And because of this conflict, the brain says to hell with it, there is no phantom. There is no arm, right? It goes into a sort of denial. It gates the signals. And when the arm disappears, the bonus is the pain disappears because you can't have disembodied pain floating out there in space. <laughs> So that's the bonus. Now, this technique has been tried on dozens of patients by other groups in Helsinki, so it may prove to be valuable as a treatment for phantom pain. And indeed, people have tried it for stroke rehabilitation. Stroke, you normally think of as damage to the fibers, nothing you can do about it. But it turns out some component of stroke paralysis is also learned paralysis, and maybe that component can be overcome using mirrors. This has also gone through clinical trials, helping lots and lots of patients. Okay. Let me switch gears now to the third part of my talk, which is about another curious phenomenon called synesthesia. This is discovered by Francis Galton in the 19th century. He was a cousin of Charles Darwin. He pointed out that certain people in the population who are otherwise completely normal had the following peculiarity. Every time they see a number, it's colored. Five is blue, seven is yellow, eight is chartreuse, nine is indigo, okay? Bear in mind, these people are completely normal in other respects. Okay? Or C sharp, sometimes tones evoke color. C sharp is blue, F sharp is green. Uh, another tone might be yellow. Right? Why does this happen? This is called synesthesia. Galton called it synesthesia, mingling of the senses. You, in us, all the senses are distinct. These people muddle up their senses. Why does this happen? Another two aspects of this problem are very intriguing. Synesthesia runs in families. So Galton said this is a hereditary basis, a genetic basis. Secondly, synesthesia is about, and this is what gets me to my point about the main theme of this lecture, which is about creativity. Synesthesia is eight times more common among artists, poets, novelists, and other creative people than in the general population. Why would that be? I'm going to answer that question. It's never been answered before. Okay. What is synesthesia? What causes it? Well, one, there are many theories. One theory is they're just crazy. Now, that's not really a scientific theory, so you can forget about it. Okay? Another theory is they're acid junkies and potheads. Right? Now, there may be some truth to this because it's much more common here in the Bay Area than in San Diego. <laughs> okay. Now, the third theory is that, well, let's ask ourselves what's really going on in synesthesia. All right? So, the color area and the number area are right next to each other in the brain. 
in the fusiform gyrus. So we said there's some accidental cross-wiring between color and numbers in the brain. So every time you see a number, you see a corresponding color, and that's why you get synesthesia. Now, remember, it, why does this happen? Why would they be cross-wired in some people? Remember I said it runs in families. That gives you the clue. And that is there is an abnormal gene in the gene that causes this abnormal cross-wiring. In all of us, it turns out, we are born with everything wired to everything else. So every brain region is wired to every other region. And these are trimmed down to create the characteristic modular architecture of the adult brain. So there's a gene causing this trimming, and if that gene mutates, then you get deficient trimming between adjacent brain areas, and if it's between number and color, you get number color synesthesia. If it's between tone and color, you get tone color synesthesia. So far, so good. Now, what if this gene is expressed everywhere in the brain? So everything is cross-connected. Well, think about what artists, novelists, and poets have in common. The, the ability to engage in metaphorical thinking, linking seemingly unrelated ideas such as, it is the east and Juliet is the sun. Well, you don't say Juliet is the sun, does that mean she's a glowing ball of fire? I mean, schizophrenics do that, but it's a different story, right? <laughs> Normal people say she's warm like the sun, she's radiant like the sun, she's nurturing like the sun, instantly you form the links. Now, if you assume that this greater cross-wiring and concepts are also in different parts of the brain, then it's going to create a greater propensity towards metaphorical thinking and creativity in people with synesthesia. And hence, the eight times more common incidence of synesthesia among poets, artists, and novelists. Okay, it's a very phrenological view of synesthesia. The last demonstration, can I take one minute? Okay. You're all synesthetes, but you're in denial about it. Here's what I call Martian alphabet. Just like your alphabet, A is A, B is B, C is C, different shapes for different phonemes, right? Here you've got Martian alphabet, one of them is Kiki, one of them is Booba. Which one is Kiki and which one is Booba? How many of you think that's Kiki and that's Booba? Raise your hands. Well, it's one or two mutants. How many of you think that's Booba, that's Kiki? Raise your hands. 99% of you. Now, you, none of you is a Martian. How did you do that? It's because you're all doing a cross-modal synesthetic abstraction. Meaning, you're saying that that sharp inflection, Kiki, in your auditory cortex, the hair cells being excited, ki ki, mimics the visual inflection, sudden inflection of that jagged shape. Now this is very important because what it's telling you is your brain is engaging in a primitive, just, it just looks like a silly illusion. But these photons in your eye are doing this shape and hair cells in your ear are exciting the auditory pattern, but the brain is able to c extract the common denominator. It's a primitive form of abstraction. And we now know this happens in the fusiform gyrus of the brain, because when that's damaged, these people lose the ability to engage in buba kiki, but they also lose the ability to engage in metaphor. If you ask this guy, what all that glitters is not gold, what does that mean? The patient says, well, if it's metallic and shiny, it doesn't mean it's gold, you have to measure its specific gravity. Okay, so they completely miss the metaphorical meaning. So this area is about eight times the size in higher, especially in humans, as in lower primates, something very interesting is going on here in the angular gyrus, because it's the crossroads between hearing, vision, and touch. Enormous in humans, and something very interesting is going on. And I think it's a basis of many uniquely human abilities like abstraction, metaphor, and creativity. All of these questions that philosophers have been studying for millennia, we scientists can begin to explore by doing brain imaging and by studying patients and asking the right questions. Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs>